If you're considering getting into entrepreneurship or being your own boss one day, make sure that you're doing something that you're going to really look back at and be proud of in 10 years, 15 years, 20 years. And if it doesn't work out the way that you want it, don't be hard on yourself. Move on to the next thing. Taste as many things as you can and make sure that you enjoy your life because there is only one of them. Hello and welcome to the final episode of the Commerce Coffee and Community Podcast Entrepreneurs Edition. Today, I'm joined by Doug Bell, owner of Northern Lights Winery. Thanks so much for coming on today, Doug. Thanks for having me. Awesome. Well, why don't you start off by telling us a bit about your background, Doug? Uh, where did you go to school and what made you decide to stay here in Prince George? Yeah, well, I'm a, I'm a Prince George, uh, n not a newcomer because I was not born here, but I've been here n since uh, 1988. Now, uh, my family grew up here. My mom's from Prince George. And uh, in 1988, uh, my parents took an opportunity to come back to Prince George uh, to open up two Wendy's franchises in the city. And my dad, who was a, a big entrepreneur, uh, had the opportunity to do a lot of different things while I was growing up. So I got to see him open car rental agencies, concession stands, farming wow. businesses, logging businesses. And I got to work with him the whole way, which was a lot of fun. Because what we saw was, uh, you know, the, the opportunity um, to do hard work and get rewarded for it. Um, and so over the years, you know, I just developed this innate ability to kind of see demand and see opportunity. And, you know, I would do that in my own personal life. Um, but then, you know, I kind of got to a crossroads. I graduated uh, high school and I was thinking about what I was going to do with the rest of my life. And initially, I really had the drive to move away from Prince George. Um, but luckily, I didn't. And I decided to take a year to think about it and go to the uh, College of New Caledonia in the city. Um, and during that time, I took some on, entre uh, entrepreneurship and marketing classes as part of a university transfer program that the college had. And I got into the program and it just blew me away. I thought this is exactly what I've been missing for my entire life, um, really looking at people and why they do things and not how to influence them, but how to put your product or service in front of them in a way that they understand the value that they're going to get if they use it. And so this kind of uh, drew, drove me to staying in Prince George and going into uh, marketing and general business at the University of Northern BC. Um, when I was about halfway through that program, uh, there was an opportunity that came up in my family group of companies. Uh, my father, uh, who was in politics at the time, um, was the Minister of uh, Agriculture and Lands. And part of uh, his portfolio was wineries and also he had forestry and mining over the years. Um, but because he was in politics, he was no longer running our family group of companies. And what he uh, did was he started to look around for somebody to take over the group because um, the person who had been running it since about 1999 uh, was departing and going on to another opportunity. And he was talking to us about what should we do with the business? Should we sell it? Um, should we try and promote someone? Should we hire someone from outside of the business? Never even approaching, um, you know, the fact that maybe I would be interested. What happened is I really realized that I felt like I owed something to my family and I wanted to bring uh, some value back to them that they had brought to me over the years. So I actually came up with a business plan on how to grow our company uh, over the next seven years. Um, and I uh, took that, I, I submitted it to our board of directors and our shareholders. And for some ungodly reason, <laughs> they decided to hire this 21 year old kid to take over this multi multi-million dollar business. And uh, fast forward to today, um, you know, we have uh, more than uh, quadrupled the size of the business. We now operate uh, about seven different business entities. We continue to grow and it's just been a lot of fun the whole way. Very cool. It's it's funny how that's kind of started, you know, all all back in the in the college where you've taken some some elective classes, got ready for the university transfer. Same same thing kind of happened to me for my uh, my schooling journey. I started out in health science, took a business elective, and, and never turned back. It's uh, it's really unique to explore those opportunities. So it, it sounds like you've had a great amount of uh, exposure to different opportunities here in Prince George, which is phenomenal to to see. Um, and and you know what a what a great opportunity you were 
able to take on. So from there, you know, we, we talk about the winery um, and speaking of the winery, where, where did that idea come from? You know, you've gone from, uh, you know, uh, like you said, a lot of your dad's previous businesses and now, uh, or then a Wendy's uh, franchises and then the winery. So how does that kind of translate? Mm -hmm. I, I always had a real interest in traveling and uh, this started kind of after high school sometime and I took about a month every year and I would go across the world and I've been to every continent except for Antarctica. I've got to make it there someday. <laughs> um, but one thing that really struck me was no matter where I went in the world, uh, I would come back to BC in Canada and I would just say, wow, what an amazing place we live in. It has absolutely everything that I travel thousands and thousands and thousands of kilometers away to see. And in particular, I really felt like uh, the city of Prince George had so much to offer and I felt like maybe I could be a part of that. So I really wanted to showcase what I loved about the city, the warmth, the people. Um, and the other thing that I really loved was agritourism. Uh, when I traveled around the world, really struck me that, you know, agriculture is one industry that binds everybody together. Right. Um, no farms, no food, we wouldn't, we wouldn't be here. And we have a very rich agricultural history in Canada, but we don't often talk about it and share it. But in one industry that we really do is in wine and food. And we can share experiences and cultural similarities from around the world within that segment. Now, on top of that, I talked about uh, earlier that my dad actually uh, was uh, the Minister of Agriculture and Lands, and he had wineries under his portfolio. So over the years, he had gotten very passionate about wine, right? He had met a lot of different winery owners. And one of the things that really struck both him and myself was that the industry wasn't like other industries in Canada. Um, it wasn't so much competitive as collaborative. And right. people in the wine industry really wanted to share their their knowledge. They really wanted you to be successful and they wanted people to drink more BC wine. They didn't mm. feel like it was something that you would going to be you were going to be taking away from their opportunities if you were to open one up. And right. so you know, his passion for wine and my passion for agritourism kind of collided. And, and we sat down one night and we said, you know, this is something we really want to do. And, uh, and there was the uh, birth of Northern Lights Estate Winery, now Canada's largest fruit winery. That's very cool and, and such a neat point to highlight of the collaborative nature of the, you know, the, the wine industry here in Canada. Um, that's not something that I think a lot of people would really expect, right? Uh, businesses collaborating um, closely like that. So that's, that's really great to hear. Um, now with that uh, being Canada's largest fruit winery, what would you say is the mission behind Northern Lights Winery? Well, we, we really want to make everybody's day a little bit better than before they interacted with us. And so sometimes we can do that in person and sometimes we have to do that through a product or through an experience outside of our winery. And, and it's been an interesting journey in order to be able to showcase what we mean and who we are as individuals on a broader scale. So for instance, um, when we first opened the winery, we knew we wanted to bring a lot of people from Northern BC in particular to the winery to experience the beautiful grounds. Right. We're on the Nechaco River, which of course is one of the two major rivers in Prince George. Um, we have the, the iconic Prince George cut banks right behind us, um, you know, and then what could we do about the wine and providing that as an experience that people were gonna take with them and, and remember, you know, make it very memorable. Yeah. Um, so that's what we kind of did. We started there just saying, how many people could we get here? And, you know, we started seeing more than 30,000 people wow. uh, come to the winery and it was incredible. You know, uh, when somebody has a wedding there or, you know, doing a movie night in the orchard or coming for wine tasting from Germany or something like that, wow. it, it's always incredible to see their faces because you know that you're making an impact on them and they are remembering uh, a piece of Prince George through you and right. you're able to make it more intimate as well. So that's where we started and then we had to develop more strategies in order to gain attention and awareness outside of, of the city of Prince George, but still bring that warmth and that approach. So things right. that mean a lot to us, like we are a carbon neutral winery and actually we work with the University of Northern BC every year to do our assessments to understand our carbon impact wow. and then to be able to purchase offsets to, to reduce that impact. Um, you know, we believe that we want to be the option for many people. 
So our products are vegan quality so that everybody can enjoy them no matter what, you know, they, they uh, have for their belief system or their, or their nutrition system. Um, and then, you know, we try and bring events and, and experiences outside of the winery. Sometimes that is in virtual format and sometimes that's in physical format um, all across the province of British Columbia from Victoria and Campbell River and Vancouver and Kelowna and Fort St. John and Prince Rupert, <laughs> all across the province. It really means a lot to us. Right. Absolutely. That's that's really amazing. That's the sense of community you've been able to establish with Northern Lights and, you know, send the Prince George community beyond Prince George. That's so phenomenal. Um, who would you say has been your biggest influence through your whole entrepreneurial journey? I have a lot of influences. I mean, I hate to always just say one because <laughs> there's so many people that have contributed to who I am and, and how, you know, I believe that I can contribute to society and the city of Prince George. But certainly, I mean, the two biggest uh, people who have impacted my life are my mom and my dad for very different reasons. You know, my dad being an entrepreneur, I remember, you know, there was, <laughs> there was, lessons when I was younger about the fact that it's okay to be competitive. Um, it's okay to be, want to be the best. And so, you know, he would always say, you know, it's not whether you win or lose, but winning is a heck of a lot more fun. Um, <laughs> it's got and, a point. <laughs> yeah. Right. So, so I never felt like I was owed anything and I, I was given an opportunity to take over our family group of companies. And I don't discount that, that there are millions of people who would love to be given the same opportunity. But I think one of the reasons I was successful was because of that drive to prove him right and, and to always win the day. Um, on, on my mom's side, it really is one of empathy, right? It's one of family. It's one of belonging. And she always talked about community, you know, whether it's uh, the friends we keep with us and making sure that, you know, we take care of them and they take care of us. And we, we you know, surround ourselves with good people who are going to be able to feed into our own morals and our own belief systems and make sure that we're contributing back to them. And, and whether that's the city, whether that's your family, whether that's your friends, whether that's the people that are working working with you. Um, that was really good as well. And I think that those two things combined really provided me a good base uh, on which I could be successful. Absolutely. That sort of degree of mentorship and trust and, and like you said, proving them right. That's, uh, that's a, a really great motivator for sure. Um, now, we'll end this section off with uh, a little bit of what Doug likes to do for fun here in Prince George. You're a very busy guy. Uh, but you know, when you do get some spare time, what do you like to do here in Prince George? Well, I mean, certainly I think that changes all the time. Uh, and that's because Prince George is such a diverse environment and there are always new things to do here. So I, I really love it here, uh, especially, you know, being a young father, um, being able to do things with my son. There's just an endless amount of things to do, um, whether really talking about the outdoor trails, um, you know, going to one of the, uh, I think, uh, a thousand lakes within a hundred <laughs> kilometers of Prince George, you know, spending a day on the lake with the family or boating or going to the park with friends, you know, really spending a lot of time outdoors, um, right. 12 months of the year, which is sometimes hard for people <laughs> to wrap their minds around when they think about <laughs> Prince George. Um, but then the other thing I think is, is also just leveling out how much time you spend at work uh, and how much time you spend at home and having a little bit of time for yourself. Uh, you know, I think, right. uh, I think sometimes we're so busy that we need a little bit of breath of fresh air. We need to stop and, and just kind of enjoy the moment for, for a while. And, and so uh, I don't judge myself when I need those as well. And, and I think that's uh, important to balance things out. Definitely important for, uh, for anyone taking on a lot, um, you know, try your best to make time for yourself. It's so critical. Um, let's jump into, uh, the entrepreneurial journey of, of Doug Bell. Um, what were some of the first steps you took to get the winery started and in building your business strategy for the winery? Yeah. So we actually started in, in about 2010, 2011 is, is when, you know, the concept of the winery first came up. So I took over a group of companies in 2007 and, and the first uh, thing that I had to do was uh, refranchise our group. So I was able to renovate uh, and learn construction and development um, in 2007, 2008 and 2009. And we invested a tremendous amount of money back into the business and I got a, an opportunity to look at things from that new refresh lens right. and develop a whole bunch of skills that I didn't necessarily have when I was in university. Problem solving skills, um, 
you know, construction development, dealing with people and learning all these, this terminology and phrases I didn't really know. So when that kind of ended 2009, we did a renovation and then I was really on to looking at what we were going to do next. And uh, restaurants were really interesting to me. Um, but you know, that agritourism bug was just getting bigger and louder <laughs> in my head. So after, uh, um, you know, a little while my dad and myself were sitting around and we decided to do the winery, um, then we really had to figure out what we were going to do. So the first thing that most people probably recognize is that Prince George, you know, isn't the best agricultural um, climate for growing grapes. Now, you can grow grapes up here, okay. but they don't always ripen. So one, one of the things oh. about grapes is you need um, them to ripen to a place where you get the right acidity, the right sugar content, and the right flavors. And although in some years, in great uh, warm years, you can actually get this and you can achieve it, other years you can't. Right. So we were doing a lot of research into other types of grapes that were being grown in Russia and Alaska and other things. And, and, and we were trying to develop different uh, formulas and winemaking techniques to actually use these and make them into delicious wines. Um, but at the same time, we were visiting a lot of different wineries around Canada, um, in BC, Alberta, and into the U.S. And uh, at one point, uh, we walked into a winery in Cache Creek, BC, which at the time was the most northern winery in the province. And we almost walked out because uh, we realized they were making fruit wines. And we said, this isn't real wine, is it? Because we, <laughs> we had never had a great experience with fruit wines to that right. point. Um, and, uh, and you know, it was so dumb of us to, to think this, but <laughs> we, uh, talked to the owners and, and they said, no, 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 like we are making something that is not like what your grandma made, you know, when you were younger <laughs> and you shouldn't have drank that. Um, what we're making here has the same body acidity, tannin and complexities as you get out of grape wines, but with an unlimited number of new flavors. And, uh, so we tried the product and we said, wow, this, this is incredible. We, we did not. <laughs> realize as a matter of fact if you wouldn't have told us that it was made out of with there was no grapes in it we would have 100 percent believed uh that there was grapes in it so we started on this journey of uh developing these different fruit wines in this new winemaking technique that allowed us to have all the qualities that we loved out of grape wine um, but with this unlimited number of new flavors um, so we did that for, for several years before we found the property that would ultimately become Northern Lights Estate Winery. Um, and, uh, and we found that property. It was uh, a little bit too small for what we wanted, but it was the perfect location. And so we decided to jump at it. We bought the land, and then now now the, the clock had started, right? Now you're spending money. Now you actually have to develop this. So we quickly assembled like what I consider an ace team of people uh, in 2013 and 2014, including our winemaker um, who had had over 30 years of winemaking wow. experience, including almost 20 years at the time of fruit winemaking experience, who really legitimized and, and fixed all of the problems with the wines <laughs> that we had been making over the years. Um, and our agrologist who was, who was voted the, the North Central Zone Agrologist of the Year, uh, and now she's a business partner of ours, uh, Noemi Touchette, who is just an unbelievable uh, business partner. I couldn't have asked for anything else, and she was number the number one employee that we, that we hired, um, along with a whole bunch of other people. And we started developing the formulas. We had to go through the licensing permitting. I mean, there was five levels of government that we needed <laughs> to get approval from. It is a highly regulated environment. We really had to, had to fight through every step of the way. It was the first winery in Prince George, so there was no um, zoning for it. There was no licensing for it so everything we did wow we had to really really fight hard but luckily you know we were, we were really well supported although i don't know that they really at the time believed it was going to work um they certainly um didn't act that way they you know the city of prince george and the people who were who were here um immediately just said what do you need let's get to work wow. uh, and after uh, another two years uh, we were able to open in the summer of 2015. Nice. That's amazing. So, you know, great note there at the end with, you know, it's so good to hear that the community has came behind you. And after all that hard work in the beginning, you know, got off to a rolling start in 2015. Very cool. Um, now, as that journey continued, um, something we talked about before was some of the events that Northern Lights hosts. Uh, what were some of the ways that you kind of got the community involved um, and really made the winery about Prince George? Yeah. So when we, when we first started, uh, we basically said, 
we want to be the winery that you can come to as a family, right? We didn't want to be a place that, you know, only adults go to, or you only go to for a special occasion. We wanted to be able to just come, you know, in jean shorts on a Tuesday <laughs> afternoon. Um, and we didn't initially have our restaurant, um, but we had this really cool picnic area. And what we did was we encouraged people to come, bring their own food down, grab a bottle of wine, and just enjoy the atmosphere. Um, later on, of course, we were able to add more services and, and such as well. The other thing we did was we wanted to bring a lot of specialized uh, events that meant something to us and to the community. So for instance, one of the first events we ever did there um, was called the Climb for Cancer. And to this day, the Climb for Cancer has actually raised over $300,000 wow. for our local cancer lodge. And it's an annual event where we showcase the Prince George Cut Banks about 600 meters from the winery and people climb up and down it. And they do this uh, one afternoon every single year and raise money for our Cordoban Cancer Lodge. Um, we also wanted to bring new experiences to the community. So we started up events like uh, Tacos and Sangria, where people <laughs> could come and sample our wines in a sangria format and try lots of delicious foods. You know, we uh, decided to start things like uh, the Easter cork hunt for kids, where, you know, they could come <laughs> to the winery and, and have a fun Easter afternoon and get some chocolate, no wine for the kids. Um, and, and then, you know, we expanded that onto things like our Light Up the Orchard event that saw over 9,000 people uh, do our walking lights tour and, and showcase, you know, the, the beautiful orchards um, and the winery itself. So just things that bring people together and, and really are surrounded by experiences, which is what is so important to us. Absolutely. And so many out of the box ideas, right? You know, in, in, how do you, how do you develop the, is, is there like a brainstorming session that you'd have with your team or how do you develop ideas like that? Yeah, well, it really is uh, an idea meritocracy. Okay. So <laughs> we want the best ideas. Um, we don't always have to be the first to come up with them. So um, to, to be, you know, shameless, we're always <laughs> looking around at what other people are doing. Right. For instance, wine and paint nights were very popular for a while. So being able to bring people to our bistro and and learn about wine uh, or learn about painting and, and drink some uh, delicious wine was really, you know, uh, seamless. Uh, we had a staff member who um, who was getting their yoga license and said, hey, you know, would you uh, be willing to let me teach people here? And checked in with the insurance company and yeah, yeah, we can do this. So, you know, we, we bring people in for that. And, and so, you know, it was a lot of ideas. It was a lot of looking around at what was working in other uh, municipalities. And right. previously, maybe um, we had always noticed that, that it took a few years um, for Prince George to get some of those experiences that were in the other areas. You know, you might see it two years, three years, five years after the idea was kind of birthed elsewhere. Um, whereas we were able to maybe accelerate the pace and, and bring things here quicker. And that's the same process we go around uh, today and, and really look at the industry leading, uh, um, you know, types of things that are going to bring people in and provide experiences that they're going to be mem memorable. Absolutely. That, that is great insight, I think, for anyone sort of looking to enhance the experiences at their businesses. Um, you know, we're going to take a bit of a turn here and, and talk about the big C. Um, you know, obviously, two years ago, businesses across the country, across the world, impacted tremendously mm -hmm. by COVID and, and the COVID shutdown. Um, and I'm just looking to get a little bit of insight of how uh, coronavirus affected operations at the winery and also how that impacted how you sold your products, if it had an impact there. Yeah. Well, I mean, COVID was very hard to start with, to be honest. And uh, I mean, we were very fortunate because our business is very diverse. And so where we lost business in some areas, we were able to pick it up in others. But I mean, the biggest thing was, of course, our restaurant, which initially had to be uh, shut down right away. And, right. you know, I, I made every, uh, you know, phone call myself to each staff member that we weren't able to hold on to for a period of time. But we really kind of focused on our key people and we tried to keep everyone employed that we possibly could and start to develop new ways of driving revenue um, that didn't include things that would have safety concerns or issues. Right. Um, so we really started to focus on like virtual events and, and bringing experiences into people's homes. One of the first things we did um, when all of the businesses got shut down is we phoned to all around to all of the games shops in Prince George oh, okay. and, uh, and we partnered with several of them, um, to sell, uh, what we called isolation packages. <laughs> uh, and it was incredible. We, we saw this boom and people were 
buying all of these isolation packages, not just for themselves, right. but for their friends. And, you know, so it had like a couple of glasses, a bottle of wine or two, and like some games that they could play, uh, whether it was like, you know, for one person or for yeah. two people or for mo <laughs> more people. And, and so, you know, people were just wanted to remind each other that they were thinking about each other. So yeah. essentially we tried to bring experiences back into people's homes and support local businesses while we were doing that. So we right. would include, you know, the, um, uh, bath bombs from one of our local companies and jams and jellies and whatever we could do to, to support the, the, the vendors and suppliers that were supporting us in the past, right. as well as not just the community of Prince George, but everywhere else. The next thing we really had to do was we had to think longer term because we realized that, you know, although virtual was great for the moment, um, that people were going to want to return to in-person experiences. Right. And so we started developing packages that people could have um, with small groups outdoors um, in safe spaces. So we had things like we brought forward the idea of tasting tables where people could come to the winery and sit down in a you know, on a table in the orchard um, and, and have some wine and do it in a safe environment that they felt comfortable. Right. Um, and, and then on the staffing side, really, you know, thinking about the safety of our team and how could we improve the facilities to make sure that everybody felt safe um, and that they had the ability to um, speak their mind if there was any concerns they had. And so overall, uh, you know, we sold uh, way more wine in, in the first couple of months of COVID wow. than, than pri prior to that. Um, and, you know, that kind of came down a little bit. I think, you know, there was a little bit of stocking up going at the time. Right. Um, but it ended up uh, being really beneficial because we learned some new ways of moving and selling our products um, that we Absolutely. hadn't had to, to think about before. Yeah. Um, and also it just gave us a real opportunity to f look at the entire P&L and figure out what was important to the business and what wasn't. And I think that what happens in times of, of surplus or times of the good times is that you end up getting a lot of things that aren't necessarily contributing to your business and you never cut them. Yeah. Um, so having that time of scarcity enabled us to really look at everything we were doing and improve. Right. And, and in some ways, you know, we have to go back to that every couple of years and really think about um, how we can operate our business more efe efficiently. Definitely. So very cool to hear that you were able to, you know, still keep those experiences intact, which are so important to Northern Lights and to the community. Um, and then secondly, that point on just tightening business operations in times of, of uh, you know, tighter times, right? Something that a lot of, you raised a great point there where a lot of businesses aren't considering cash flows too much when times are good, but the minute times turn, right, that then those decisions really have to be looked into. Um, so that's great. What about uh, your most satisfying moment of your journey followed by your least satisfying moment. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? I, I am a, one of those weird people that I'm all about the journey and, and, and not necessarily the destination. Um, we have very high goals. And I think that, um, one of the things that I don't do a very good job of as a, as a leader and as an entrepreneur is celebrating successes because in a way I I've expected that success to happen already. I've won in my mind before we've done it on paper. Right. And so what happens often is, is we pass thresholds, um, whether it be a sales figure, whether it be uh, a number of, uh, bottles that we produced. Um, you know, last year we produced our 500,000th bottle and, <laughs> and we're going to be at uh, 750,000 very shortly because wow. we've accelerated so much yet. You know, when we are talking, uh, to our consumers, um, I never really reflect back on that. I'm always talking about what's going to happen in the future because that's right. what's exciting to me. Um, and, and vice versa, I, I never get too down as well because I, I, it's my belief that everything that happens is in my control. Now, obviously the pandemic was not in my control, but what I do about it is. And so I'm never competing, um, you know, against the market. I'm only competing against myself and trying to be the best version of a business leader that I possibly can. So without copping out too much, <laughs> I, I don't really have a lot of regrets. I, I, I think I tried a lot of things. Lots of them were, didn't work. I mean, I had tons of failures over the years, products that I thought were going to blow up and, and do really, really well that didn't, you know, um, marketing programs that I thought were going to excel and totally tanked. 
Um, and, and a verse, vice versa, you know, things that I didn't expect to do well have, have done incredibly well. But the one thing that I'm more proud of than anything else is the people that I've been able to develop under our company. And at times we have over 160 employees in the city of Prince George within our group. It's a lot of people yeah. and people are relying on, on us, um, to pay their rent or their mortgage. People are relying on us, um, you know, to take a trip or, you know, they've gotten married to people that they've met within our organization. Mm -hmm. There are so many like great stories of, of the people that have, um, dedicated their lives or a portion of their lives, um, to our business. And, and when I see them successful, whether that's with us or whether that is somewhere else, uh, it just gives me an incredible amount of joy. And, uh, and I think that a lot of them will never, uh, really realize an impact that, that we've played. And maybe that's a game I play in my own head that I've made an impact. Um, but I certainly think that is one of the best things about being a, a an entrepreneur. Absolutely. That's, that's fantastic. Just having that, uh, you know what, I think it's a good measured outlook in terms of you should celebrate more, Doug. Absolutely. Crack a bottle of wine. You know, you got <laughs> plenty, plenty where you are. Mm -hmm. Um, but you know, being able to not be down on your losses, right? I think that's a huge barrier that entrepreneurs will face. And I think that's that's crushed a lot of entrepreneurs at the very start of their, before their journey can even begin. Well, so, I mean, I think that the, what people got to realize um, is that for an entrepreneur, it's not just a job. I mean, this is an extension of yourself. This is your life. And when you have those micro failures, it's very easy to get down. But if you let that affect how you are going to perform the next day, then what happens is you end up letting your team down because you're not able to perform at your best because you're not focused on the thing you need to do, which is improve the business every single day. And if there's one day that you should never feel bad about, um, one day being off, but you need to just move on to the next step. And I think the people who are most successful are able to do that. Right, no, absolutely, that's, that's great. Um, let's go back to the very start of your entrepreneurial journey and Every hindsight's twenty twenty, you know. Uh, but what would one piece of advice uh, that you wish you had at the start of your journey be? I would say take your time, like be patient. Life is a lot longer than you think it is. <laughs> we spend so much time in our lives focusing on what is in the near future. Um, and I and I heard this said once, but it's amazing how little changes in two years, but how much changes in ten years. And when you, if you think, just think about in your own life, where you were 10 years ago, and what did you think was going to happen between <laughs> then and now? And maybe you had some big goals, maybe you've achieved them, maybe you haven't, but there's no denying that you have evolved so much as a human being, that you have, that there's been so much growth. Um, and so I think often um, we, we put ourselves in these time crunches because we say, you know, I want to be a millionaire by the time I'm 25, or I want to do this, or I want to own a Lamborghini, or I want to do this, this, this. The, the, the question is really, is why and what is the big hurry? Because right. um, for most of us, um, you know, if, if, if I don't get killed crossing the road tomorrow, there's a good chance that I'm going to live until, you know, 80, 90, 100, 110, maybe by the time that I get to that age. And so when I think about it, I'm like, at this point, not even maybe a quarter into my working uh, lifespan, right. right? And so if, as I de develop as a business person, um, I am going to learn so much. And if if I was 20 right now and I was starting my own business and I said, you might dedicate the next 10, 15 years to this business and you might go broke. What would you say? You'd be like <laughs> devastated. Yeah. 15 years of my life because when you're 20, that's almost your entire lifespan, right? <laughs> Up until that point. But then right. you realize that you're 35. And at 35, you have a whole lifetime in front of you. <laughs> You're going to have another double your lifetime, probably before you retire. I mean, some people, maybe they get lucky or they want to retire early. I understand. But most of us are probably going to work to some degree until we're 70. And if right. you're 35 and you can work your entire life up until that point, you can, you can fix any problems or anything that's happened. So take your time. Be patient. Don't worry about what happens in the next year. 
worry about what happens in the next 10 years. I, I think that's super important for young entrepreneurs in particular to hear just being in your early 20s, you know, having what you think is the, the magnum opus of all ideas and trying to develop that in a hurry, you know, got to slow down a little bit, measure your success and and keep going at it. Right. There's plenty of time. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, why don't we go into the advice section of the podcast where uh, we'll talk a little bit about products, um, mm -hmm. you know, obviously almost 750,000 bottles of wine sold. That's a, that's an incredible, that's a number I can't even fathom. Um, now I think a lot of people are wondering what is your process that goes into designing products that people want to buy for one. Um, and then for two, do you have any, uh, recommendations for a general process that people can follow to figure out if they have a product, uh, that, is sellable to sort of the mass market or to define what their market actually is. Yeah. There's so much that goes into a product, but I mean, most people talk about product market fit, right? And it's yeah. really, it boils down to something that's simple. Is someone willing to pay for your product? And I think m many of us, myself included, uh, have this innate ability to believe that the right product will just sell itself. So one of the first things I actually recommend people do is learn how to sell, learn how to be a salesperson. Because if you don't know how to sell, it doesn't matter what kind of product, if it's, a, it's just the most amazing product in the world, if you don't know how to sell and make a buck, um, then it may not work. So it could just be like, buying something on Facebook Marketplace and trying to sell it for $5 more, right? Going to a garage sale, finding something, going on, going to like uh, the, uh, the dollar store, right? You can literally go to the dollar store, go on Amazon, yep. and you can scan the barcodes and you can find out what people are selling it for. Yep. So you could actually grab a few of these things and you could try and sell it. And I just recommend, try and make a thousand bucks. See what happens. How long does it take you? Do you like it? Because if you don't like it, you may not actually enjoy the business itself. Right. The, the second thing is that uh, you really got to think about demand, right? Yeah. Um, in Prince George, uh, we had the benefit of being the only winery in Northern BC. Now, if you go down to the Okanagan, a lot of wineries really struggle because land prices are extraordinarily high right. and there is 300, 300 wineries in a very small area. <laughs> so can you imagine competing against that? Yes, there's benefits because there's more tourists and those type, types of things, um, but there's a lot more supply. So mm -hmm. the demand is higher, but the supply is higher. Does that work out in your favor? Um, however, in Prince George, we knew that people drank wine and that they enjoyed wine and that there was no local product for them to buy. So uh, uh, supply was low, yep. demand was high. This was an opportunity for us. Yep. Um, the, the second thing is really trying to identify what the problem is you're solving, right? And why do you, do you think that this will be beneficial to the consumer? So I, I, lots, of, lots of people will come up to me and ask me like, you know, Hey, I've got this great product. Will you buy it? And, and I'm like, well, not really. I mean, this, you think this is the best product in the world, but I actually see it as one of 10 different products that kind of ser ser serve the same purpose. So if you can explain to me how this is going to solve a problem for me that no other product can solve, um, then that's great. If it is solving the same problem as something else, then you be it becomes a game of either better or lowest price. And so at that point, you're going to have to fight and scrap a lot more to Absolutely. be successful. Um, and then the last thing I would say is, is really think about, is this a product you would use? And, and if so, then start asking people, right? And don't just ask your mom and your dad, because of course they're going to be supportive, <laughs> but, you know, talk to people in yep. the community, you know, post, like I always said, you know, if, if I was going to do a product or service today, I would actually open up a Facebook page trying to sell that before I had it. Right. And I would then go and I would say, so like, let's just say that it's, you know, uh, insoles and I found this really amazing way to make a better insole. Well, I would open up an insoles, uh, uh Facebook page and I would then try and go ahead and sell it. Yeah. Uh, and at that point I would find out how many consumers I really had. Um, and then I would then 
contact them and say, hey, actually, I don't have this product yet. You're part of a trial. We're testing it out to see what the demand is like. As soon as I make it, I'm going to give you a free one. I'm going to ship it to you. Um, yeah. Thank you so much for, for your support and actually being willing to pay for this product that I haven't even made yet. Uh, people will probably react very well to that. And you're going to have an initial group of people who are going to support your brand. And they're probably going to give you a ton of exposure. Absolutely. Those are, those are great points. Like uh, foundational sales skills key, right? Getting before you even start, you know, thinking about what your, what your product is or how you want to sell it. Um, very important. And then also, you know, doing that market research, finding out if people are interested in it, finding out what type of product seller you are, if you're a value product, if you're, uh, you know, fi uh, fitting a niche. Um, so yeah, really, really great there. Now, now that we know some advice on how to sell a product and how to determine um, whether it'll sell or not, uh, I think people are really interested in getting their products into stores. Now, as a winery, I know uh, Northern Lights is available at dozens, if not hundreds, of uh, of liquor stores across BC. Um, do you guys go out past BC in, in liquor stores? or Not in liquor stores yet. Okay. And, and the reason is because we haven't been able to fulfill demand in BC. Oh, so okay. at this point, we are, we're producing as much <laughs> as we possibly can, yeah. and, uh, and we're selling all of it. Right. Um, so we have uh, requests for a product uh, in Texas and in you know uh, China and wow. in Toronto and all these other places that we haven't been able to, to yet uh, um, do so I mean this is just part of that process right absolutely yeah. but I, I think what you're what you're getting at is really that that sales aspect and I kind of touched on it earlier but one of the things that I think is is really underrated is the ability to create emotional connection um, and so there, there are two things that you really need. One, there's, there, one is called selling in and the other is called selling out. And actually, uh, my sales manager was talking to me about this the other day and I think it makes complete sense because um, essentially what you're doing when you're selling in is you're getting product into the store. But yeah. if it doesn't move from the store to the consumer, then it doesn't really matter, right? right. Um, so some people will focus on the end consumer and not necessarily the store, and they wait for the, the, the customers to go to the store and ask for your product, and then they'll come to you and ask for that. Right. Now that's right. one way of doing it, but it is it can be slow and it can be uh, you know very frustrating at times because you might uh, appeal to say a thousand customers, but only two of which go to each individual store. And so is that enough for that, for that, um, you know, owner of the store to decide to bring your product in? Yeah. Um, the other way of course, selling in is, is a little bit easier cause it's the B2B play. Mm. And it's, it's really about that, uh, connection that you can create with people. So, um, to start with, it's just about your friends, your neighbors, right? right. Who own a store, creating connections, going, uh, you know, to your local chamber of commerce events and learning from them, right? Meeting people in the community and saying, hey, this is who I am. This is what I do. But ideally, you don't want to ask for anything because everything you do, you want to ideally provide more value than you ask for it in return. Right. And so if, if you can, and this isn't possible when you're scaling and a lot of times is you actually, you go to that store and you support that person in a lot of different ways. Could be personally, could be professionally, you know, maybe they've got a kid that needs a coach of their soccer team, <laughs> right? Something like that. Yeah. You can then, um, start to, to develop a connection with that person. And that is, it has to be a real connection. Like you really right. have to do it cause you want to do it. Yeah. Um, that will create, uh, the, the need for them to support you as well. And so then they're going to say, Hey, you know, Brandon, you, you've been <laughs> doing this for four years. Why do you, you know, you keep supporting my charity fundraiser. You keep doing this, you keep doing that. And you've never asked me to carry your product. What the hell's wrong with you? <laughs> uh, and, and you know, they're going to care so much more about supporting you because of what you've done. Right. Um, and, and you know, that's easier said than done, but it, it is, I think the best way to do it if you can. Yeah. And then on the selling out, it's, it's attention arbitrage, right? So what you're, what I mean is that you are trying to get as much attention for your product as humanly possible. And so you, you have to do that for the lowest cost possible. Yep. And you have to look at all of the d diverse ways that you can get in front of somebody. So think about how you spend your time. How much of your time do you spend on your phone? Of that time, how much do you spend on TikTok, Facebook, Instagram, <laughs> LinkedIn, yeah. uh, Twitter, 
Twitch, whatever it might be. Um, that's one program, but then, you know, TV still works for a lot of people. Yeah. Radio gets a very different, uh, demographic, uh, programmatic digital billboards, um, you know, sponsoring yeah. the local soccer team and putting your, your name on their Jersey. All of these things are designed to gain attention. So the first and most important thing you need to do is gain attention. And then you need to know what is it, what is it that I want to say? What's the most important thing right. that I'm going to tell you when I leave? Uh, that's, that's going to give you the, uh, the, the want or the desire to try my product. And then lastly, but probably should be number one is, is my product a good value? Are you going to have it? Are, are you going to feel like it was worth more than the money you spent on it? Because if you think that it's worth the same amount of money that you spent on it <laughs> or less, you're probably not going to buy it again or you'll buy right. it, but not frequently. But if you feel like you got more value, um, than what you spent, then you're going to, you're going to be a loyal customer for a very long time. Another great point. Absolutely. Um, one, one thing I feel, uh, just, just taking a step forward is, um, there's a lot of entrepreneurs out there who have families who have significant others, and they're worried about striking that balance between following a dream and, you know, taking care of their family, spending time with their family, um, you know, not driving their girlfriend crazy by doing too many things. Um, how, how do you go about striking that balance and filling, you know, the role of a father, the role of an entrepreneur and the role of a husband in your day to day? Uh, you can't to, just to be honest. Um, but the number one thing is don't judge yourself. Who cares? Like, like at the end of the day, uh, we are doing the best we can with the information we have in the moment we have. Um, I've had a few friends over the years that I've had really serious conversations with about like, you know, they, they're talking about, oh, I wish I did this and I wish I did that, right? Well, the fact is, is you didn't. And by the way, you don't actually know what things would have turned out like if you would have done that, right? right. Maybe they, uh, you know, let's say that you didn't get a job offer, right? Because yeah. you, you didn't do well in, a, in an interview. Um, well, maybe you would have been in that interview. Maybe you would have gotten that job. And it turned out that that boss was the biggest a-hole of them all, <laughs> right? And yeah. maybe that boss then turned around and, and kind of like, took you down a peg and, and you became less confident and then you couldn't succeed at the level that you would have versus you not getting the, the job you wanted, but going into another position with someone who became the mentor that really drove you forward in your life. Um, there are times when I don't feel like I spend enough time with my son, right? Um, there are times when I feel like I don't spend enough time with my wife. There are times right. when I feel like I'm not spending enough time on my career or, or my business. And the fact is, is that the next day I get up and I try and rebalance and I do the best I can. And then the next day I do the same thing all over again. And I think that if you wake up too many days in a row and you feel like you're missing out on something, you do need to rebalance, right. but it will always come at a cost and that's okay. Yeah. As long as you're okay with saying, you know what? I'm just doing my best here. I'm going to spend the time that I can. Right. Right. And, and it sounds like having those conversations, not only with yourself, but also the people and the stakeholders per se in your life, you know, your, um, maybe your managers at the store or, you know, your, uh, your wife just saying, Hey, I need to focus on the business today. Mm -hmm. Or you tell the managers at work, I need to take a personal day to, uh, to, you know, be, be super dad kind of thing. Right. Um, I, yeah, I think that's, that's super critical. Well, what you're saying, it, it makes total sense. And, and I think the way that you communicate it is important. Um, and, and the way that, that your actions will speak louder than words as well. Yeah. Um, but you know, like to the, you know, this podcast takes away uh, a period of time with my family and, yeah. and that's okay because they understand that what I'm trying to achieve. Yeah. Um, and also though, if my wife has to go away for a little while, then I'm supporting her too, right? If yeah. she wants to go away on a vacation or like a, uh, or like just something that we can't all go to, then I'm going to take extra time off and make sure I'm taking care of our son. So, right. you know, it works both ways. And I think that as long as it doesn't become one sided yeah. where you're taking yeah. away from the relationship and you're yeah. not investing enough into it, then it's okay. Yeah. Um, but I do think that you do have to consider the other people in the equation Absolutely. Um, and, and make sure that, you know, that you talk to them every once in a while and say, Hey, yeah. you know, am I doing okay? Or do you need a little bit out of this? 
um, while at the same time making sure that you are really focusing on yourself too. Because Definitely. if if I can't be happy, I'm not going to make the people around me happy. So right. I need to make sure that we're balancing that almost more so than than balancing between the different career things. Absolutely, absolutely. With um, no, with with family and with you know everything else like like we've we've talked about, it's it's hard to find that balance. But you know, if you've got the right people in your life uh, and you're able to share your time effectively between those and keep communication open, um, then by all means. Go do that entrepreneurial dream. If you have a dream team of people behind you to support you, all the better, right? Absolutely. Um, now, I know we talked about uh, not looking in the short term with the winery. Uh, you know, not looking two years, but looking 10 years. Uh, how about five years? Where <laughs> where does Doug see, uh, where would you like to see the winery here in Prince George sort of over the next five years? I want to impact as many people as I humanly can. And when I say that, I, that might be one person or that might be one million people. But I think that what drives us at the winery forward is we want to continue to grow and expand our footprint of providing tremendous experiences for people. And if I can do that, um, I'm just going to continue to, to push forward. Um, and I think that the winery is in a unique place where it can be a leader within its own industry, within Northern BC, within the city of Prince George, um, within the wine industry. Uh, and, and ideally, we want that to be recognized at the higher levels, you know, at the eventually the national level, potentially international level. Um, but, you know, it's less about the numbers for me than it is about the impact that we're making. And as long as I feel like I'm making an impact, then I think we're doing our job. Well, thank you so much again for coming on and closing out this season of the Commerce Coffee and Community Podcast, Entrepreneur's Edition. Doug, you've been a fantastic guest with some great advice, and I'm going to ask you for just one last piece of advice to close out the season. Well, I think that if you're considering getting into entrepreneurship or being your own boss one day, the first thing that I ask that you do is you really look inside yourself what it is you love to do. Your career, your business life is going to be the thing that you spend more time at than anything else. In a lot of ways, you're going to spend more time at your job than you are going to at your family or other parts of your life. And so it has to be something that you are passionate about, that you love. And if that means that you're going to make a little bit less money, that's absolutely fine. But make sure that you're doing something that you're going to really look back at and be proud of in 10 years, 15 years, 20 years. And if it doesn't work out the way that you want it, don't be hard on yourself. Move on to the next thing. Taste as many things as you can and make sure that you enjoy your life because there is only one of them. 